Hi, I'm Shashank Bhargav and you're listening to Three Things, the Indian Express news show. In this episode, we talk about what the latest government data reveals about our health expenditure. We also talk about the challenges of tracking two tigers who have killed two people in Uttarakhand. But first, we bring you a bizarre story of revenge. One that involves a Bollywood actor and a man who somehow gets her arrested in a foreign country. And all this because of some very petty arguments. Indian Express's Mohammad Thawar has been reporting on the story for the paper and joins us in this segment. Mohammad, begin by telling us who is the person at the centre of the story. Okay, so the person at the center of this is Chrisanne Pereira. She's an upcoming actor. She's uh, had small roles in uh, Sadak 2 and Batla House. And she's also a theater person. She's uh, been part of uh, several stage shows of various plays. And uh, generally also, you know, she's present on Instagram, fairly popular, puts up dance videos. So yeah, that is uh, Chrisanne Pereira, Mumbai-based, Kandivali-based to be precise, upcoming actor of Bollywood. And what do we know about what happened to Chrisanne Pereira? So what happened to Chrisanne is that, you know, she was contacted by someone who told her that, you know, there is an audition for an international web series that is happening in Sharjah and, uh, you know, whether she would be interested. And uh, so this person said that, you know, we will uh, also pay for your tickets to go to Sharjah. And uh, she was like, fine, let, uh, you know, I would be interested. Now, on April 1st, the day that she is to fly to Sharjah, a few hours before her flight, this person who had contacted her, he tells her that, you know, you meet me at a hotel near the airport. I have something to give you. And then he gives her a trophy, a memento kind of a thing and says that, you know, you need to carry this to Sharjah and need to give it to one of the production people over there. And, you know, it's an innocuous looking memento and it's not a suitcase or anything. So she felt, okay, fine, you know, like I'll go ahead with it because till that point of time, there was no indication that this was eventually going to turn out to be a crime that it did. And when she reaches Sharjah airport, she was told that, you know, there will be hotel bookings for you. When she calls up the hotel, there are no bookings. She is told that there's a car that will come to pick you up at the Sharjah airport. When she reaches Sharjah airport, no one has come to receive her. So now that is the first time when she starts suspecting that, okay, wait, there's something amiss about this. Now, this is when Krishan decides to call her father and tell him what's going on. And in their conversation, she also mentions the trophy that she was asked to carry. Now, that raised alarm bells and her father realized that, wait, this is something doesn't sound too proper. So he told her that, you know what, you take the trophy to the airport authorities, to the airport police and give it to them so that, you know, if there is anything wrong, you are not caught up in it. Now, unfortunately for her, what happens is when she goes to the airport police and uh, gives the trophy, they open up the trophy and at the base of it, like there's this very small place where they find, you know, some nine grams of ganja and uh, the khaskhas, which is opium, which is again not allowed in the Gulf countries. And since they find her in possession of the narcotics, she is detained and eventually arrested on charges of narcotics. Wait, so even though she was the one who went to the UAE police with the trophy, and told them that something might be amiss. Instead of investigating the matter, they arrest her instead? Yeah, that is the odd part because, in fact, she had left the airport premises, but she still came back and showed it to them. But because they found narcotics and, you know, in UAE, like in many Islamic countries, laws related to drugs are very stringent. So, because this thing was in her possession and they found drugs in it, they were not sure what to do with it. But then, because it was in her possession, they go ahead and arrest her. So, as per law, strictly speaking, it is in her possession. But, I mean, the surprising bit is that she herself went to them with it. So, that is indeed odd that she is arrested in spite of the fact that she is taking the trophy to them rather than it being found uh, while them searching her. After Krisan is put in jail, her parents start figuring out what they need to do. They initially struggle because they don't know the person who had contacted her. They then get in touch with the Ministry of External Affairs, they contact the media and also go to the Mumbai police. Later, when the authorities start investigating the matter, they find one person who was regularly in touch with the man who had told Krisan about the audition in Sharjah. This man 
was Anthony Paul. And they tell this family that, you know, do you know any such person? Because this person seems to have called up on the number used by the other person quite frequently. And then the family realizes that, okay, this Anthony Paul, his sister resides in the same building as the Pereiras do. And in the past, Krishan's mother has had fights with Anthony Paul. And when I say fights, I mean just arguments. Like there were two occasions. Once during COVID, her mother Premila had shouted at Anthony for not wearing a mask and not following COVID protocol. And once when uh, Anthony had some objections with them feeding a local dog. So, you know, there were these small altercations, not even altercations, small arguments that they had. And that's when they informed the police that, yes, we know this person and we've also had a fight with this person. Though Mohammed says that at that time, it seemed too small a reason for him to do this. But turns out that this was true. Anthony was the one who got someone to get in touch with Krishan and got the drugs planted in a trophy so that she gets arrested in a foreign country where laws against drugs are very strict. And all this because of arguments over wearing masks and the neighborhood dogs. Yeah, that is uh, something that really stood out as odd for the police, for Chris Ann's family, because, you know, this was something that, I mean, these fights were not major fights. And the family had even forgotten about it. In fact, uh, you know, her mother has told us that after that, they had passed each other and they had smiled. And, you know, so she thought that this was not something, a fight that was being carried forward. They thought that, okay, this is done now. I mean, it was a small thing. So for a person to hold on to a grudge for such a small thing, then plan out, you need to remember that he has paid for the Shahjah tickets. So what cops are saying is that he's at least spent some 30 to 40,000 to plot this entire thing, to source the narcotics, to have someone call her up. And he's researched everything because when the other person calls up Chrisanne and tells her about an audition, she has some questions. So he has researched about how the industry functions, what is the name of the show, who's the director. So he's, you know, invested time and money to elaborately plan this entire alleged revenge. And that was something quite odd and everyone involved till the time they saw a pattern. And the pattern is that Anthony has actually done this with four other people. And he managed to do this with the help of someone named Rajesh Borate, who got in touch with these people for him. And again, all of this for extremely petty reasons. So, for example, in January, there was this woman called Monisha de Mello. Now, a relative of Monisha had broken up with Anthony and he was very upset. And in order to get back at Monisha's cousin, he, you know, looked around who are the family members involved, zeroed in on Monisha, knew that she is into uh, dress designing. Then he makes Borate approach her as somebody who has a big order for, you know, dresses in Sharjah. In this case too, similar pattern, he pays for the Sharjah trip. He gave her a memento. But in her case, she kind of uh, realized that there was something amiss about it. And, you know, generally people, when they are traveling abroad, you are hesitant to take things from people while you're flying. So some of these victims managed to save themselves by either dumping that in the garbage bin outside the airport. Or in one case, this man called Rishikesh, he outrightly refused to take a cake that Borate gave him. But not everyone was so lucky. Krishan, for example, ended up spending 26 days in jail before she finally managed to get bail though she is still not allowed to leave the country. But a man named Clayton Rodriguez is still in a Sharjah jail since February. When we asked cops that, you know, why Sharjah? So they told us that, you know, he had come across a video last year in which he saw that in Islamic countries, the laws related to drugs are very stringent. And uh, amongst the Islamic countries, the flight ticket for Sharjah were the cheapest. Hence, he decided to send everybody to Sharjah. In all the cases, he gets his accomplice Rajesh Burate to contact them by offering them jobs in their field of expertise. In all the cases, on the day that they're supposed to fly, he either gets Burate to give them a memento or a cake and in all the cases he then calls up the Sharjah airport authorities and tips them off that such a person is coming and this person has drugs. And Mohammed, since this case has come to light, we understand that Anthony and his associate Rajesh have both been arrested. Could you tell us what all has Anthony been charged with? 
Yeah, so basically Anthony has been charged with sections related to narcotics, with questions related to framing someone, cheating. They have, you know, added a host of sections. And uh, the police recently also arrested uh, the drug peddler who allegedly uh, gave him the drugs which he planted uh, in these, you know, trophies and cakes. Anthony is still in police custody and the police are interrogating him, trying to find out other details, trying to find out if apart from these five people, are there any others whom he's tried to implicate in a similar manner, whether anybody else has helped Anthony and uh, basically gathering strong evidence against him. Right. And do we know what's going to happen to both Chrisan and Clayton, who is still in jail? So in case of Chrisanne, she luckily, like the court in Sharjah granted her bail on the 26th. So after spending 26 days in Sharjah Central Prison, she is now out on bail. But her passport is still with the Sharjah authorities. The family has hired a lawyer. Today, the case will be heard again. And the moment she gets her passport back, she can fly back to India. So she is awaiting that. Unfortunately for uh, Clayton, the process is slightly longer. He's been there since February 6th and he is yet to get bail in the case. So he's still lodged in the prison. The police say that Chrisanne's case was relatively simpler because the Sharjah authorities did find footage of her leaving the airport and coming back. And if she had, uh, you know, wrong intentions, she wouldn't have returned to the airport having escaped it. And also the fact that she was the one who approached the cops. So these are two factors. And thirdly, that the amount of drugs found on her was just around 8-9 grams. So these three factors make her case fairly simpler as compared to Clayton on whom the Sharjah police had found around 50 grams of drugs along with a note saying that if you need more drugs, I have it. Secondly, in his case, he did not leave the airport based on Anthony Paul's tip-off. The police were the one who reached him, searched him and found this. So these two factors kind of go against his case, but his case is also being pursued by the police and his family there. So eventually he will be released on bail and the family is hoping that he gets his passport and returns to the city. But Chrisanne's case is likely to bear result pretty soon. I mean, if today the court grants her the passport, she can come back tomorrow itself. But in Clayton's case, the process is going to be slightly longer. And next we talk about India's health expenditure. Last week, India released its latest national health account estimates, a report that shows how much the government and we as individuals have spent on health. Now, although this is the latest report that we are talking about, its data is from April 2019 to March 2020. And this period shows us some important trends in healthcare. To know more about the report and what the data reveals, my colleague Utsha Sermon speaks to Indian Express's Anona Dutt. So Anona, can you first tell us what the National Health Account Estimates are? So National Health Account Estimates is a report that the government has been coming out for, I think, six, seven years. And it basically estimates the spending that has happened in the entire year for healthcare. Whether it's from the government, whether from people, from insurance payers, all these modes of payment and they look at what is this money spent on? Is it on primary care, secondary care, tertiary care, medicines, diagnostics? So it basically gives the entire uh, money inflow and outflow in the healthcare system in the country for the year. Okay, and today we're talking about the latest report which talks about the period just before the pandemic, which was 2019 to 2020. And before we talk about its details, can you tell us why we don't have the data for the last two, three years instead? So this sort of consolidated report, first of all, wasn't there till just a few years ago. Then after they started this exercise also, it took some time to standardize all the methodology. There were changes done in the initial period. So now, of course, there is a set format. But it takes time to do all this. First of all, the financial year has to end. After that, they will start looking at the data and then compiling the data from states because a lot of the spending happens from state governments as well, health being the state subject. So collating this data from all these different sources, it takes time. So you have written that there were four major findings in the report. What is the first one that stands out for you? So the most important metric that this uh, report looks at is the out-of-pocket spending, which is like spending by you or me. 
but not through like an insurance or government scheme or anything where you're like directly paying a healthcare provider from your salary that is the out of pocket spending and the aim of any government is to reduce this to the minimum so that people do not you know go into poverty or debt just because of medical expenditure so the the current year's report shows that the out of pocket expenditure is 47.1% of the total expenditure done on healthcare by any source this has been reducing in the last few years since the report uh, started coming out and there has been quite a drastic drop from over 50% when we started looking at the report it has come down okay so out of pocket spending coming down seems to be a good thing but do we know why that has happened so that relates to the second important finding of the report which is the spending by the government so the second trend that we see in the report is that along with this reducing out of pocket expenditure we are seeing an increase in the government spending so the spending by the government as percentage of our gdp has gone up to 1.35% right now and the government had set a target for like 2.5% of the gdp by 2025 it might not happen but uh, the trend is that the spending on healthcare is on the rise which is again a good thing because it brings down the cost to people the third finding of the report which is also important is that a major chunk of this spending that the government is doing on healthcare is on primary healthcare which is very important because primary healthcare actually focuses on preventing diseases and not you know getting your surgeries and going into a specialist primary care looks at preventing diabetes it looks at screening for cancer so that there is an early detection and uh, the government is spending money on that and the fourth was that again this is a specific part of the government spending which is the social security spending which is basically the premium that the government pays towards the government insurance schemes apart from the central scheme there are also schemes by state governments and this is also on the rise is what we have seen in the report okay so what we are seeing is that the government spending on healthcare correlates with people spending less from their own pockets but some of the experts that you have spoken to actually raised some concerns regarding this could you tell us what they told you so essentially what they want to say is that the increase in the government funding that has happened over the years isn't proportional to the decrease that we have seen in out of pocket expenditure so yes government spending has gone up and yes out of pocket expenditure has gone down but these two numbers are not proportional so their worry is that why is it that this out of pocket expenditure has gone down like what is the other contributing factor and what they express concern over is that the total spend on the healthcare uh, sector be it by the government private sector whatever the total spend on the healthcare as percentage of our gdp has also gone down which essentially means that healthcare services are not being utilized uh, as much which shouldn't happen if the government spending is increasing which means that the cost of care to people has gone down and if there is a free service available more people should actually be utilizing it but that is not what this shows it actually shows that fewer people are going to the hospitals fewer hospitalizations are happening fewer opd visits are happening and this is why this total out of pocket expenditure has gone down so that is their concern that why is it that people are not utilizing the healthcare services so of course there would be a need to do more study to figure this out like why is it that utilization of healthcare services has gone down even though i don't think uh, the cost of services has gone down by much and in the meantime are there things that experts suggest that we can do so the two things that they have suggested is that the government schemes are great the implementation of it has to improve and a uh, second thing is we have to strengthen our government systems altogether so that those who do not have the option of even the minimal pay or aren't able to get facilities under the scheme they are able to get it through government systems right and anona as we mentioned earlier this report shows the pre pandemic health expenditure 
Now, as someone who has been reporting on health for quite some time, uh, do you think the pandemic and the post-pandemic data will show drastically different results? Yes, of course, there is likely to be a huge change in the government spending on healthcare for uh, 2020-21 because this is the year we invested a lot on pandemic measures so there was a lot of not just you know spending in terms of managing patients or the routine costs that are incurred by a health facility but also a lot of investment towards say ventilators oxygen plants oxygen cylinders all of this there was a lot of uh, spending in 2020-21 so, yes, uh, the government spending is likely to see a huge jump in that report. And what the our expert also pointed out is that that is also the year where our GDP crashed a bit because there was no economic activity. So if we look at government spending as proportion to the GDP, that is likely to shoot up because both things happened. Government expenditure went up and the GDP went down. So there is likely to be a huge change. And in the end, we talk about the tracking of two tigers. For the last few weeks, the residents of two villages in Uttarakhand, Dalla and Simli, have been terrorized by two tigers that are said to have ventured out of the Jim Corbett National Park. Now, within a span of two days, the tigers managed to kill two people in the area. And since then, the forest department officials have been faced with the terrifying task of capturing these two tigers. And while they were eventually able to catch one of them, the other still remains at large. In this segment, Indian Express's Avnish Mishra, who got to accompany the forest department officials, talks to my colleague Rahil Filippos about the challenges that they faced and what the villagers have been going through. So Avnish, how did this tiger menace in these two villages begin? When I was talking to the villagers in uh, Dalla village, which is in uh, Rikhni Khal Tahsil area of Pauri Garhwal district, they told me that uh, they first saw the tiger on the 11th of April. However, the actual conflict started two days later on the 13th when uh, the tiger first attacked a cow and uh, because it was afternoon time around 3 p.m., around a dozen villagers, uh, they gathered and they tried to chase the tiger away. This was not a very new thing for the locals because the village is kind of uh, isolated and it's near the hill areas. It's also around 10 to 12 kilometers from uh, the Jim Corbett National Park. So wild animals was not a very uh, new thing for them. But obviously tiger is not that common because generally the tigers do not enter human habitats. They refrain from coming out from the forest area. So yeah, after the villagers uh, tried to chase the tiger away, just a few minutes later, they came to know that uh, the tiger had attacked uh, one of the locals. It was a 65-year-old uh, Viren Singh Rawat and uh, the tiger grabbed him by the neck and uh, kind of took him uphill around uh, 30 to 40 meters. I mean, the tiger was in front of the locals for around 90 minutes and for 90 minutes, uh, they were trying to kind of scare the tiger. They built a fire, they throw mashals at the tiger and once the tiger left the body, they brought the body back but uh, he was long dead by then. And uh, from there, there was frequent sightings and uh, two days later, on 15th, there was another attack around uh, more than 20 kilometers in Simli village, which is in Dhumakot Tahsil area. That village is also borders with the Jim Corbett National Park and uh, that was a separate incident. In that incident, also a, a 75-year-old man was killed because his house was very close to the forest area and uh, he was killed in a very similar fashion. Right. So at the time of these attacks, did the forest officials think that the same tiger was responsible for both deaths? I mean, at this point, uh, we are pretty sure that both the incidents were from different tigers because at this point we have photographs and everything. But initially, it was highly possible that they were different tigers because tigers can travel up to 35 kilometers in a single day. But it was highly unlikely that a tiger would attack someone on the 13th and that two days later, the same tiger would attack someone around more than 20 kilometers and then come back because the tigers were sighted in Della village where the first incident took place. So it was highly unlikely and to confirm that uh, the teams collected samples 
from both the places and they were lucky to get the saliva samples from both the spots where the killing happened and they sent the sample to Hyderabad for testing. I'm not sure if the DNA result is out or not but even without the DNA result because we have photographs and everything at this point we are sure that that was a different tiger. The tiger in the second case was much older and in the first case in Della village we came to know that uh, earlier it was assumed that uh, it was a mother-son duo but uh, one of the tigers, the bigger tiger, was caught and uh, the tiger was a male, 1.5 years old. So at this point, we know both the tigers were different and uh, the tigers in the first case were brothers. Right. And Avnish, these forest department officials had to carry out a pretty terrifying task, right? Like that of catching these two tigers. How did they actually plan to do it? So the problem in this particular case, the attempt to capture the tiger in Dalla was that generally the teams are able to bring their equipments, they are able to bring vehicles and everything to that place. But this particular village was in the hills and there was no uh, proper road to reach there. So bringing a vehicle or a jeep was not a possibility. In fact, I remember, so there was a three-ton cage which was to be used to capture the tiger. And uh, it was really tough to bring that cage to Dalla village because it was a trek of three kilometers. So in Dalla, initially the teams tried to uh, capture the tiger by luring the tiger into a cage. A goat was initially used as a bait and uh, there were some incidents where uh, the tiger came very close to the bait and the cage but somehow it did not enter inside. So there was a possibility, I mean the forest department teams were speculating that the tiger was probably looking for a larger prey and that is why he was not interested in the goat initially and because of that uh, he was attacking cattle, cows and buffaloes and bulls. In one incident, the tigers attacked a bull and for two days, the bull was kind of roaming here and there which, with injuries on his body. And after two days, he was dead and that bull was also used as a bait, but that was also not very successful. So after these failed attempts, the teams decided to tranquilize the tigers and they set up a machan in the field near Della village. But uh, that also was not very successful because uh, for a dart gun to be used, the tiger has to be within 30 meters of range. Right. And they were eventually able to capture and tranquilize one of the tigers, right? So how did that happen? So after four or five days of camping in Dalla village, the tiger left that village, probably because of regular movements of the teams and everything. So the tigers might have got scared and they shifted to another village, which was around 13 kilometers from there. So for two days, the team set up camp over there and later on, I think it was on Thursday when there was a sighting in nearby Jui village and because uh, Jui village has uh, much more houses and it's in a kind of a plainer area, they were able to bring some jeeps and vehicles and they were following one of the tigers and hiding behind one of the houses, uh, one of the veterinary doctors was able to tranquilize the tiger. As of now, uh, one of the tigers and this was the bigger tiger of age 1.5 years. So this tiger is caught and because one of the tigers is caught now, it's going to be much easier for the team because earlier they were scared that if they try to chase the first tiger, the second might attack from behind. So now that is not a possibility. So it's expected to be much easier for them to catch the other tiger. But as of now, the second tiger is still on loose in a nearby Dalla village. And how have the locals in these two villages been reacting to these developments? So seeing wild animals is not a very new thing. But most of the time, these wild animals include leopards or boar or bear or snakes. But tiger is a new thing for them. So it was terrifying. And uh, after the curfew was imposed, people were not coming out in the night. And another important thing to notice is that this happens mostly in hill areas. And uh, the thing is, in hills, there are not many job opportunities. So the youngsters and the male members of the family, they generally leave the place and go to plain areas for their studies or their jobs. So in these villages, the people who are living are mostly women, children or elders so obviously it's much harder for them and uh, even though most of the families did have ration for a few weeks the main problem was uh, getting fodder for the cattle because generally these people go to the forest areas to like bring leaves or grass or anything for their cows and buffaloes and other cattle 
but after this incident it was not possible so people were uh, kind of locked inside their houses even in daytime they were not uh, able to go out in a group of less than four five people so yeah definitely that was very much problematic there was fear people were scared they were not uh, able to get items of their daily need so it was uh, definitely uh, problematic you were listening to three things by the indian express today's show was edited and mixed by suresh pawar and produced by ucha sermon rahil philippos and me shashank bhargav if you like the show then do subscribe to us wherever you get your podcast you can also recommend the show to someone you think will like it share it with a friend or someone in your family it's the best way for people to get to know about us you can also tweet us at express audio and write to us at podcast@indianexpress.com at